All right. Are y'all doing well? I've never been on this stage before. I'm usually preaching from, from the, uh, I almost said pulpit, from the floor. Well, up here today is a very, very special person um, in the body of Christ and in South Florida. And also to my life personally, he has been my pastor since I was six years old. Would y'all give it up for Pastor Tom Peters in the house today? He and his wife uh, came down from uh, North Florida for a great opportunity, and that was to pastor four women and four children. And they took that opportunity and put their hand to the plow and grew the church to thousands and thousands of people attending every week and missions, dollars given every year all around the world. It says of Trinity's missions that there was not a place in the world where the sun was shining that there wasn't a Trinity ministry supported. So literally the whole world was impacted uh, by Pastor Tom and Marianne. And Miss Marianne, I just want to give honor to you as well. I know that you put your hand to the plow. You stood right alongside of your husband. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your influence on my life. And just the difference that you and your husband have made together. So we honor you today. And sitting right behind them was one of the elder couple, Tom and Sandy. They served on a plurality of elders for 30 years. The eldership served together. And so I honor you, Tom and Sandy Chapel, for your friendship and for your encouragement and how you just also poured into me. So we honor and love you. And so I literally could go on and on just honoring this couple because they lived a life of integrity 40 years they raised the church up 33 acres all of it's debt free there's a school of six to eight hundred kids just a phenomenal testimony of a life of integrity and how many of you can appreciate leadership with integrity hello and so that's this couple and so um we are going to do something a little bit different today this, you're going to get a sneak peek into what many breakfasts look like, what many times in the parking lot look like. I'm going to just ask some questions to Pastor Tom and just let him pour out. And so, Pastor Tom, I don't know if you want to greet or say anything. Yeah. Well, it's our blessing to be here today. It really, really is. And uh, Dan and Joanna, we love this couple. Tell you a little story about them as we get started here. Dan wanted to marry a, a young lady from, well, a Spanish girl. And I said, uh, well, Dan, he's sure, yeah. So he went over uh, seas and he saw Joanna, but he didn't tell me it was Joanna. I knew Joanna, but not when he told me that. And he came back. And uh, because I have, had preached over uh, for Jerry Vaughn, and uh, she was, told me a while ago, she was 19 at the time. She was his secretary, and she served us well while we were there. So Dan came back saying, I've met the one, Pastor. I met, and I said, listen, let me just give a word, of, not warning, but caution. When you met, meet somebody from an, another nation, and you don't know anything about them, you better just really, you know, just kind of move slow. And uh, at that time, if I had I known it was Joanna, I'd have said, go for it. <laughs> you know. But, uh, but then, of course, later on found out that, uh, and she's such a uh, fine young lady. I'm telling you, this couple is something. How many appreciate them? And uh, Dan, uh, well, well, actually, Dan by himself, Pastor Dan. Well, he was Pastor Dan. Then I'll call him Dan when he was when he was uh, serving in the life of the church. But he was actually on my staff. That came, but he came to the church when he was six years old. His mother brought him, and uh, he came up through the ranks, so to speak. He was just faithful. I'll say something about that in a minute. But he was just faithful. And uh, eventually we came uh, over our youth group and young marriage and actually used to preach every week a service there at Trinity. And uh, so finally, with a call of God upon his life, 
he and Joanna. Uh, they talked to Pastor Matt and uh, Matt Baker, who is the pastor of our church now. He's my grandson, by the way. When I stepped down, he took over. He said, now I can run it the way I want to. So, <laughs> But we used to travel, so we used to travel together. He, he, he carried my bags then, but uh, was a, just a tremendous uh, young man. But he really saw the anointing on Dan's life, and he sent him forth with a with the blessing of our of our house of our church, and so uh, I I called him last night and said, "Now remember, I'll be with Dan and Joanna this weekend. We'll be with them." And uh, he said, "Well, I've been praying for you." So, uh, but at any rate, Dan, we've watched him come up through the ranks and serve in whatever capacity, Dan and Joanna, whatever capacity they could serve in. And uh, so they just wanted to be faithful and serve God. So we appreciate them so very, very much. And Tom and Sandy Chapel that he talked about a moment ago, Tom and Sandy are our, our best friends. And uh, actually, they've been in the church 43 years. But uh, Tom is an electrical engineer and uh, graduated from UF. And he and Sandy worked hard to, to build a company. And uh, Tom actually went throughout Palm Beach County and even other counties. I'm just saying this about them now because I, I'll probably make reference to them a little bit later. But uh, they finally, they came to our church from the Methodist church. Nothing wrong with the Methodist. And I mean, I was raised Southern Baptist. Nothing wrong with the Baptist. Uh, I imagine you got folks here from just about everything that you can imagine. Some from no church, but that's fine. Uh, now you can get right with God, so that's good. Uh, yeah, but uh, Tom uh, gave up a lucrative job, he and Sandy. He was an electrical engineer, as I said, and still is. Uh, all over the county and other counties, I mentioned that a moment ago. But God's hand's really been upon Tom and Sandy, and he did... He gave up his business. I don't think you ever give up anything when you start serving God. But they left their income. I mean, I'm talking about their, uh, he had uh, businesses and so forth. And, uh, but we needed, uh, he came to become our uh, financial manager. And, and Sandy came with him, of course. He had to drag her along. So, so anyway. <laughs> But they served faithfully in the church. And then he was an elder, as Dan mentioned a minute ago. And I'll just say something about, uh, about that. How can you serve with men on an elder board for as many years? Over 30 years we served together. And uh, how, did, how did that work, Pastor? Well, first of all, they recognized the spiritual authority that God had placed in me. And I want to mention the spiritual authority that God has placed in this young man. And it's really important, especially a new work, that you recognize the spiritual authority. And that simply means that under God Almighty, they are under the great Lord and Savior, Jesus. They are shepherds under the great shepherd. But the anointing of God up on their life to do what God has called them to do. I mean, I work with the elder board. I'm going to tell you something, guys. I'm going to, I'm going to get, just get out here with you. I mean, just talk out of my heart about this thing. I intend, didn't intend to get into this, Dan, uh, right now. And, you know, I, but uh, our elder board, we work so well together that... Uh, they knew if I said, fellas, I heard from God. Now, we ran the church. We ran the church, the eldership. And, and everything that we did in the life of the church, we ran it and gave oversight to it. And so they would say, I'd say, God, fellas, I've heard from God. This is what we need to do. Then they would always follow that because they recognized and realized that the anointing was upon me to be the shepherd and anointed upon upon them to be an elder 
But they always, if I told them I heard from God, man, there was no question. But if there was something, but I wanted to be honest about it. If there were times when I didn't hear from God, but I thought it was a good, it was a God idea. Well, maybe it was a good idea sometime. There are good ideas and God ideas. But um, if I had something I had to talk about that I thought God might be saying, but he didn't speak to me about it necessarily, and I'd tell him that, then it would it'd be open for discussion and we'd really get into it. But I'm telling you, the anointing of God upon a shepherd's life, there's a spiritual authority that God places upon them. And I'm just saying this for the benefit of you guys. I tell you what, when God sends you to a place and puts you in a place and you know that he sent you here, you need to be planted here and bloom where God has planted you and serve with this couple and honor them as the shepherds of the house and recognize the spiritual authority. If he says, God told me this, you need to listen to it. You need to listen to it. And when he makes decisions you may not like, they're the spiritual authority. And Joanna will always pop the balloon if he gets out of line. I like that one, pop the yeah, balloon. Pop the balloon. But uh, I'm talking about your head, you know. But anyway. Uh, you used to tell me, you used to tell me the anointing would be so strong in four services. But as soon as you got home and Marianne told you to take out the trash, the anointing <laughs> yeah, left. <right. laughs> it still works. Still works that way. We've been, we've been married now for uh, uh, 62 years in January. Wow, let's give it up. 62 years. Amazing. But uh, I've always said she's as strong as 40 acres of garlic. But I'm as strong as probably 45. And uh, just a little bit. Just a little bit. How much? 50, she said. But we both always wanted to be in charge. It, from our marriage, we wanted from the beginning, we wanted to be in charge. Now, I tell you what, Dad, I got to shut up and we we'll talk about what you got to ask me today. But uh, I'm going to tell you guys how to have a, a marriage where you can stay together and it's not perfect. But the way you can always stay together is agree to whenever you have something that you want to do and your companion doesn't. Just to, just agree to be disagreeable, you know. You just agree to be disagreeable. We used to have go into three days of silent treatment. Come on, you know, you, you know what I'm talking about. And but uh, now we just agree to disagree, and uh, and still smile. And and uh, I'm usually the first one to break the silence. So, but anyway, it, <laughs> she said it's true. <laughs> But uh, we'll still hug and kiss. Yeah, we're still still doing that after after all these years. But but anyway, uh, it's just wonderful when you have a marriage where you can agree to disagree and still go on together and hug one another and life just goes on, you know. So that's good for a marriage. That's just something on marriage I thought I'd throw in. So anyway, I'm going to just turn it over to you, Dan. You sure, take no, it from Thank me. you for sharing that, especially when we talk about marriages, man. That's real life. And you guys have modeled that. And not everything has to be perfect, but you've modeled a healthy marriage. And thank you for modeling that. One thing we wanted to talk about, you talk so much um, about defining success correctly. And actually, in the book that I wrote, I put your definition. My, I made what, the book. You made the book <laughs> of, of what success is. And I think that, you know, the world has a version of success, but so does God. And so you've talked a lot about that. Can you maybe share what you feel like is that your definition of success and what um, what your three keys of success are? Well, the three keys for success, and I think this will be better. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that so much. Would you take that top off for me? Uh, but I mean, I could, but I mean, that's easier for you for me trying to do it later. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Uh, so three keys for success. And it's so simple, but people miss it so easy. And I'm going to give you scripture today. If you're taking any notes, you might want to just jot down some of these scriptures. But the three keys for success is found in the book of Luke, chapter 16. Three verses, 10, 11, and 12. 10, 11, and 12. And in essence, what it says, 
if you are if you will uh, be faithful in that which is least then God can make you ruler over much. You become qualified to, to be over much. He can give you greater responsibilities whenever you're faithful with what God gives you. That's verse 10. And verse 11 basically tells us that uh, uh, we need to be faithful in unrighteous mammon. New King James says, the uh, New Living Translation says, in worldly wealth. Uh, be faithful when you're faithful in that then God can bless you, but not only that, can give you, it says, true spiritual riches. And the way I look at the true spiritual riches, I've always looked at it this way. Uh, I believe, you know, you've talked to many people that say, well, I, I can't read the Bible because I, I, I just don't understand it. And I just don't know what it means. Well, I believe true spiritual rich, riches gives you the ability by God to be able to get revelation in areas where you need revelation. See, there's treasures in Christ. And that, to me, is, is what the word is referring to when it talks about those treasures, heavenly treasures. It is in Christ, and we, we can pick all these things. It helps you learn how to sit with him in heavenly places. All of this is found uh, in, that, in that second verse. So when you're faithful, when you're faithful in that, then... You become qualified to be faithful in much. And then the third one is where this young couple fits in today. When you're faithful in that which is another man's or another woman's, then God can make you or give you your own. That's what it actually says and means. So this couple has set an example because they served me served Pastor Matt, served in a capacity where they could do whatever, they, whatever we needed them to do. And Joanna, of course, serving Jerry Vaughn. And uh, so they both served in that capacity. And as a result of that, God has given them their own ministry. And there's an anointing upon their life. And I want to come back to just say one more thing about this spiritual authority. You need to, uh, to recognize the spiritual authority in this couple and just recognize that God is working in them and through them. Okay. And now you asked me about the definition yes, of sir. success of success. The definition of success is twofold. Number one is progressively becoming the person that God wants you to be. Did you get that? And that involves, that involves, of course, the faith, those three keys to success, but being faithful. So just progressively becoming the person that God wants you to be. And then uh, success number two is progressively fulfilling the goals or the visions that he gives you for your family, uh, but that God gives to you personally to see those fulfilled. So it's all about God. It's all about God. And so success is recognizing that God Almighty wants to work in us and through us by his power and by his spirit. And so if we'll let him do that, we're going to le you'll, you'll learn success. There's no, no question in my mind. Now, if, if I were to ask, now, that, see, that takes it out of the, the, the world's uh, uh, definition of of success and puts it in the spiritual. Don't you agree with that? Yeah. yeah. So that's so vital. It's so important. But now for some people, let's say, well, we talk about success is causing, uh, climbing the ladder, uh, career ladder, uh, you know, nice homes, nice cars, big bank accounts, and blah, 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 blah. And, uh, and nothing wrong with that. God blesses us in that area. And you're blessed here today because of that. The chapels are blessed today because of, of that. My wife and I have experienced it. All of you have experienced the blessing of God upon your life, I'm sure. And prosperity has come to you in that respect. But you need to keep everything in perspective. And you need to realize that when it comes to, to success, you need to realize that it's God that gives it to you. And you've got to honor him always. 
and you can't make money. Now, let me say this about having things. God's not opposed to you having things as long as he has you. Hmm? You can have things, but don't let the things have you. Make sure God is the one that, that, that you, you know, that you're honoring all along through all of it, putting him first in every area. And I know you know that, putting him first, but I'm talking about actually pastoring a church and, and what Pastor Dan and, and Joanna, what they do in giving oversight. And so, uh, but it's, it's, and you know what, the way you can know that it's not all about things is when the Bible tells us very plainly that money and say money is the root of all evil. What does it say? Love. Yeah. The love of money is the root of all evil. Money is just simply a medium of exchange. I mean, we need it to operate, you know, in our life and so on and so forth. But uh, when it comes to the things of God, we need to understand that the love of money becomes the root of all evil. That's exactly, and boy, when you, I read that in the scripture for the first time, when I did read it, I began to meditate on that, and I thought how true that is, Pastor Dan. It's that love of money, not, you know, not having things as long as things, things, I mean, that's not the love, that's not what they're talking about. You can have things as long as things don't have you. I hate to repeat myself, but that's so true to be able to know that God's got your love 100%. Hallelujah. Um, you can't take your money with you. This reminds me of a, of a story. Go for it. This man worked four and five jobs and got every, all the money he could accumulate and put it in a number of different banks. And I mean, he neglected his family and all kind of relationships. It was all about him and that money. And uh, when he got ready to die, he called his wife in and said, Honey, I want you to do me a favor. She said, Well, what's that? He said, Now, you know I'm getting ready to pass. And when I die, I want you to get all my money and put it in my casket. I want to take it with me. She said, You've got to be joking. He said, No. I want it in my casket. I earned it. It's mine. I want to take it with me. So he died. And at the funeral, they were getting ready to close the casket. She said, hold it just a minute. And she went up there with a little box and put the box in the casket, went back to her seat. And her friend that knew that the husband had asked for that said, you didn't put that man's money in that casket, did you? She said, well, I did, what I did was this. I went to all the banks he had money in, took it out, put it in my account, and I wrote him a check. <laughs> she said, if, if, he, if he can cash it, he can spend it. <laughs> so you can't, have you ever seen a, a, a hearse pulling a U-Haul trailer? You never will because you can't take it with you. It's so vital, folks. Once we close, listen, I, I'm, uh, I'm 82 tomorrow, as a matter of fact. I've, I've stopped counting birthdays. The only reason I do is that my wife reminds me of how old I am. I walked across the dining room, and I looked on this big mirror that we had on the wall in the dining room, and I shouted at Mary and said, Honey, I look like an old man. She shouted back and said, You are an old man. So... So at any rate, don't let me lose what I'm trying to say. <laughs> so, uh, but you can't take it with you. When you close your eyes for the last time, that's it. That's it. And, you know, the, the more I serve God and the closer I get to that point, and I'm not planning on checking out today, but, hey, our times are in his hands. Amen. But I know I'm right with God, and now I'm ready to go. And so I want to stay that way. Regardless of what happens, I want to stay that way. And that should be the heart of every believer. And you need to be instilling in the lives of your children that God must be first. Folks, there's so much garbage going on today in, in, our, in our nation, uh, the schools. Uh, that's why we started an academy. That's why we got to have over 600 
students on campus every day. And our motto is strong education for world change. And we have graduated hundreds of students that have gone out and are making a difference in their world for Christ and the kingdom. So you need to instill that in the hearts of your kids. God's given you the responsibility to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and teaching them that mom and dad still have the authority in the home. Discipline. Discipline. Are you, are you going to give us a, a counseling on that? No, I'm just going to say discipline. And uh, a lot of them need it from time to time. Here's how they're going to learn it. I've always preached this way. You're going to learn discipline. Their ch children will learn discipline. They'll either learn it at home or they'll learn it in school. And nowadays, if they're going to the, well, anyway, in the school, they won't get it in the school, not in our public schools. Uh, our teachers don't even want to work. First of all, today, and I'm not saying that for those of you that are teachers perhaps here today, and there's good teachers that I believe, godly Christian teachers that are missionaries uh, in the public school. So I'm not knocking that. But they'll either learn it at home, the discipline, or they'll learn it in school, or they'll learn it uh, through uh, law enforcement, or it used to be a time when you would learn it in the military, or they'll go to prison and learn it. So they're going to be, there's going to be discipline there, and you have to instill that in the lives of the children and bring them up in that way. Okay, Dan. So I'm just hearing so many themes. You know, we talk about money, riches, parenting, marriage, but really what I'm hearing is just all about God, yeah. and it's just so God-centered, but not in a religious way. Um, just uh, amazing. Thank you for pouring out today, Pastor Tom. At Trinity, you had so many um, salvations. We saw so many people get saved, but not just people just stay, you know, in the initial infant stages of salvation. People graduated, if you will, in the school of the Spirit, and there was so much move of the Spirit at the church. Can you kind of maybe talk about that along with spiritual hunger in the lives of the people and the lives of the church when we talk about what does it mean to be saved and then filled with the Holy Ghost? When Mary and I first took the church down here, as Dan said, there was only uh, four ladies and four kids. And, uh, but we came because we loved, we loved the call of God, but we loved, we'd prayed and heard from God and knew that we were coming with God's blessing upon our life. We knew that. So that's why we took that young church. But we did, we had begin to have so many uh, getting saved. And it's because the people knew we loved them. Listen, if a pastor, the very first thing should come from the life of a pastor is love for his congregation. And if it's not there, they need to padlock the door and go home. Because God, you're representing God and the love of God. I know this couple, and I know the love they have. He's already talked this morning to me about how much he loves you guys. And so you say, well, man, you, are you serious about that? I'm serious. So uh, we came with the love of God in our heart to our people, loving God first, loving our family second, and loving the ministry he had called us to third. So that's, that's vital. But we loved them. We began to win them to Christ. But we realized it's one thing to win them, but it's another thing to disciple them. And we instantly begin to disciple them. And... Uh, and just pr prepare them for, for serving Jesus and, and uh, growing in Christ. And uh, it's just great the way we were able to do that. Now, we started out uh, just with, I mean, we just did everything in the beginning. But as we got new converts, we started committing it to them, committing it to them. And they began then to... Uh, go from there and do whatever we'd ask them to do. And so I remember, I was just, this just came to my mind. Uh, I remember with so many new converts, we had a few pastors that had retired that started coming to the church because they love the, we'll talk about the, the hunger in a minute, Dad, but, but we, they started coming to the church because they recognized that God was doing something there. So I gave them responsibilities, those teachers, to teach Sunday school for us. And, uh, but I had one requirement, 
and that is that they be in service at least once a week. Yeah, you can't teach if you're not there. And you can't teach if you ha don't have the heart of the body of believers that you're a part of. And so I, I put that word out. And uh, I mean, I had some pastors <laughs> that turned into, I said, turn in your books if you can't come at least one time a week to church. And uh, they turned them in. So what did I do? I turned to all of these new converts that we'd been teaching. And they made some of the best teachers. I mean, some of the best. I mean, they're not going to be perfect now. Our daughter came home one day and said, Mom, Dad, you know what sister so-and-so said? And she told us a bad word the teacher said while she was teaching. I said, well, just be patient with her. And I'll tell you what, that couple, that was way back in the beginning of the years ago. And they're still in the church today, that couple is. But they taught and reproduce themselves in the children so there's always when you have a bunch of new converts you got people that really are hungry for god and want to see god do some things and so uh it's just a blessing to do that see that now what's that? oh yeah you're asking me about the spiritual part uh that is the spiritual part of that but also uh we always had prayer we always believed in prayer. Remember this about prayer. You say, I don't pray much. Well, let me tell you one thing. You're going to pray one way or the other, either by choice or by crisis. Crisis praying is help, Lord. And the Lord does help us in a crisis. We've all been there. But choice prayers are people that have a time with God every day. My wife and I every day have our devotions and, and reading the scriptures and uh, that's daily, every day, every morning. We get, all, we get started that way. And so uh, you're going to either pray by choice or pray by, pray by crisis. Choice prayers are people that still go through things, but it's a lot easier to handle it because they've been communicating with God. Can you, can you give me an amen on that? So that's so important. But we trusted in the, the spiritual aspect of the, of the church as far as uh, God working in all the body, all the body. And so uh, we used to have prayer on a regular basis, really taught people about devotions, uh, having a daily time devotion with God. You say, I don't have time for that, Pastor. You make time for anything you want to do every day. And that's something, that's one thing we need to do because we're, it's, with our, it's communicating with our Heavenly Father. So that's so, so very, very vital. But we used to, uh, and let me just tell you, you're in a church, and I know the Pastor Dan has talked about this and Joanna, uh, and the type of church that you're in here today where you believe in the power of the Holy Ghost and how he can flow through a believer let me just give you an example. My wife took me to, to her parents' church when I was as lost as a goose in a hailstorm. I mean, have you ever seen geese flying and hail if it falls? They just go everywhere. They get lost. Now, they can come back together, but they get lost. And actually, we were both lost at the time. And uh, she actually had had an experience in the Lord. Well, I had too as a, at a very young age. But I was raised in an alcoholic family. My father was an alcoholic, two alcoholic brothers. But my mother uh, gave me a little training in the beginning uh, in a, a Baptist church, Southern Baptist church. And I never forgot that training that, that, that I got there. But I drifted off and followed them into alcoholism. And so God, I had a lake, lake experience where I almost drowned. And then in that experience, I uh, repented and came to God. And uh, we all were singing, all my life he has been, all my life he has been good. Every time I, we sing it now at home, I sat in the pier a while ago, I had to hold back the tears. Because that's the way God's been in my life ever since the day I came to Christ. But sometimes people have a problem identifying being filled at salvation and being filled with the Holy Spirit after salvation. Hmm. 
my wife took me to this church that her parents had and that were a part of. And a lady gave a, a message in tongues. I didn't know what she was doing. And because I was Southern Baptist, I didn't know what she was doing. You know, they don't believe that, you know, that's just that not for today. They taught a lot of good things, but that was one thing they didn't teach. So the guy, uh, a lady, gave a message in tongues. And when we left, I told Marianne, I'll tell you what, the hair stood up on my arm. I had hair then. It probably stood up on my head, too. <laughs> but I told Marianne, I said, I never, ever, I don't know what that woman was saying, and I don't care. I'll never go to one of those churches again. Little did I know the humor of God. He's got me pastoring one of them now, or at least pastoring one now, still in the church. And uh, so uh, I realized there was more to being saved in, in, by the Spirit and being filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. You understand what I'm saying? Jesus said, go into Jerusalem and tarry till you be endued with power from on high. And be witnesses for me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And so in order to do that, there has to be a supernatural power. Salvation is wonderful, and the Holy Ghost does a work in us at salvation. But also there is the infilling of the Holy Spirit. The infilling of the Holy Spirit. And we were a part of a, a whenever we got saved, uh, we were part of a little church of about 40 or 50 people, Dan. And uh, it was small, and, uh, but full of new converts. Full of new converts. And I think that's basically all we had was just new converts. But we had a pastor who taught me about missions, taught me about prayer, taught me about the Word, and about being filled by the, with the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, he instilled in the hearts of all these new believers about being filled with the Holy Spirit. We used to have all-night prayer meetings while people just waited on the, in the presence of God and just, and, you know, just waiting in the presence of God. And, and uh, sometimes our prayer meetings would last, we'd say, from 6 in the afternoon till midnight, and people would sign up on the, the Sunday before, and they'd take an hour you know, and we'd have six hours of prayer or go all night with prayer, sometimes all night. Usually, near the end, most of us were sleeping on the pew, but, but we'd have them. And so one Wednesday night, we were in church. All these new converts now, all desiring to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden, the brother, one of the brothers, was up at the, up at the front at the altar. He was praying. And the pastor was on the platform, and he lit up. The pastor did, and he grabbed the microphone and held it down to this man's, you know. And I'll tell you what, he was speaking in perfect Chinese, even though I don't know Chinese, but it was unbelievable the way it, it sounded like Chinese. But I, we knew that he, he was a Nazarene brother, and we knew that he was just baptized in the Holy Spirit. And you know what happened that night? It just, one, cu one couple to another couple to another couple, they didn't even have to get out of their seats. It just hit them like that. Bam, bam, bam. And they began to, be, to speak in tongues in the congregation, just people being filled with the, baptize of the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Me with Southern Bap being a Southern Baptist, <clears throat> I didn't get filled that night. I walked out, looked up. At, I was mad at God. I was mad. And because he, I didn't receive like they did. But it wasn't God's fault. Holy Spirit was there. It wasn't the Holy Spirit's fault. And uh, I told Marian, I'm going back to the Baptist church. And uh, I think she said, well, go on then. No, I don't know what she said at this point. But then we, I, I began to realize the way the hunger comes the Bible tells us that hey, they that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. And in the fifth, it's actually uh, in the Beatitudes, uh, chapter 5, verse 6 of, um, of uh, Matthew, I believe it. Yeah, Matthew. And uh, it talks about uh, God, if you're hunger and thirst, after, hunger and thirst after righteousness, you shall be, shall be filled. And that in the Greek, that, that word is written. 
Uh, and what it actually, mean, uh, actually means is this. It's called a present durative tense, which simply means that you will be satisfied by receiving the Spirit, but you won't be satisfied continuously. There will always be that desire to hunger for God. In other words, he, he fills you at that, um, at that time, there's, fills that hunger, but there's always that continuation of God desiring for you to desire him so he can fill you more. Now, let me tell you this. Listen closely. Of course, later on, two years later, I think it was, when I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, but, man, I'm telling you, he is a companion to me. Today, I don't know why I waited so long. But we had people going home, uh, Pastor Dan going home. I had to pull off the road uh, because they were getting filled with the Holy Spirit. I mean, it doesn't have to be in church. It can be anywhere. I suggest you not do it on the job. But, uh, but it can happen anywhere. And, and uh, God wants to fill you, but he won't do it. And, you know, it's, it talks about how the spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets. So there are always those uh, that uh, you just have to be, you don't have to embarrass yourself or embarrass anybody else either. But when the spirit begins to move in a place, then you flow with him. And as we begin to hunger for God, hunger for God, then I begin to realize there's one way that, that that spiritual hunger will come to a congregation. Fasting. I didn't say feasting. I said fasting. And I know you all do fasting at uh, the beginning of the year as you pray for 21 days to get the wisdom from God as you uh, go into the new year. Well, you need to have time, regular times of fasting. And fasting makes you hunger, hunger for God. And so we were just talking, I'll let him tell you sometime about what God, what he's doing now with hunger. But spiritual hunger, when you start fasting, there's a hunger that rises up within you that only God can satisfy. And so the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and folks, listen, the Corinthian church knew all about it. I'm telling you, they had, they, boy, there's so many things in the scriptures that talk about the Holy Spirit. And just to give you an example, when, when Peter went to the house of Cornelius, those were Gentiles. And am I going too long? Are you with me? Okay. Uh, but in, uh, yeah, okay, Cornelius. And sent for Peter, an angel told him, uh, Cornelius was given offerings and send for Peter and he'll come and and tell you what you need to know. So Peter didn't even know what he was going for till he got there and they told him. And so he, he just began to preach the gospel to him, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And as he talked, the Holy Spirit fell on those people. They knew absolutely nothing. It was the Spirit of God. And another perfect example is when uh, Paul went to, in, Ephes in Ephesians, Paul met 12 disciples and asked them if, if they had received the Holy Spirit. And they said, we've never even, since they believed, they said, we've never even heard of the Holy Spirit. He said, well, then how are you baptized? And they said, John's baptism. And, uh, but they didn't learn anything about the Holy Spirit. But John's baptism, that's not what God sent John for, for that purpose. I'm talking about John the Baptist. So Paul laid hands on them and prayed for them. Folks, it's in the scriptures. And when he did, they began to speak in tongues and prophesied. Now, here's why the Holy Spirit is so vital. I'm just going to take this minute here, Dan, if I can. To, to make Spiritual hunger is what God wants to instill in this house. And it's going to be through your shepherds. But the script, one of the most important, if not, if not the most important chapter in the Bible is Romans chapter 8, beginning with verse 26. And it tells us sometimes you don't know how to pray as you should or as you ought to. And all of us face times, and the, and the Holy Spirit said, I know you, I mean, the Bible says, I know your weaknesses, or the Spirit knows our weaknesses. And 
that uh, if we will just trust him to teach us how to pray. But sometimes you just don't know how to pray. It could be over many things that you walk through in life. But the scripture tells us that the Holy Spirit will pray through us with groanings which cannot be uttered or which cannot be articulated in our regular kinds of speech. Hey, that's what it says. And then it goes on and says this, but he, God, who knows all hearts, hmm, he knows the mind of the Holy Spirit. When you begin to pray in the Holy Spirit with your heavenly prayer language that you got when you were baptized in the Holy Spirit, or you're going to get, And then, as a result of that, God, who knows all hearts, knows the mind of the Spirit, who makes intercession for us according to the will of God. I can say some things about the will of God. That's the sweetest place in all the world, to be in the middle of the will of God. But then it says that God knows the Spirit, as He a Spirit's heart, as He makes intercession for us according to the will of God. And then it says, and then we know that all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. It didn't just show up right after talking about the Holy Spirit and tongues, but that's where the, listen, I wouldn't want to go around the block with it. I wouldn't want to walk out of this building. I wouldn't want to sit up here another minute without the Holy Spirit flowing in my life and through my life. And I'm telling you, God, you look at the scriptures, it's there. It's there in the word of God over and over again. That's what Pentecost was all about. On the day of Pentecost, I'm talking about when the power of the Holy Spirit fell upon those believers in Jerusalem. They spoke in languages, but they spoke in languages people understood from their own countries. But then Peter stood up and said that this is for They said, what does this mean? He said, this is for you, for your children, and for as many as the Lord our God shall call. So he wants to baptize everybody in the power of the Holy Spirit. Not some weird, off here somewhere stuff, but things that are done indecently in an order like we always had, Dad, but we had the gifts operate, and I've got to shut up. Father, thank you today for this people. Thank you, Lord, for just doing a mighty work in this house. Give Pastor John, uh, Pastor Dan, I had John on my mind as a moment ago, a moment ago. But Lord, touch Dan and touch Joanna as they work together. And Father, let there be in this house an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Lord, bless the people and touch them and minister to them by the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, hallelujah and amen. amen. I'm sorry, amen. Dan. For no, you did longer. good. I could talk to you a couple more hours. I will say this. Go ahead. He picked my, out of all the spiritual sons, I have hundreds of them that have come in under our ministry, Marianne and I, spiritual uh, uh, couples. And, uh, but Dan used to, we used to sit in the car in the parking lot at Trinity. He'd pick my brain. He'd pick my brain. He'd pick my brain. All the, more than any of my spiritual sons. Hadn't I told you that before? Yeah. Amen. Let's honor Pastor Tom today. Love you, sir.